Down the Dark Lane, Three Thrillers from the Motel, by Ned DeHaan, the audiobook, made available on Black Box Online Radio. Please like and subscribe and consider supporting this channel at buymeacoffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, slash blackboxned88, allows you to make a donation or contribution. Green Green Charlie, Part 2. Then I looked at the bottle of Thunderbird wine, and it was already empty. I'll just go get another, I explained. Then I turned and headed back to the fridge wall. I figured I could tell her. There couldn't be too much harm in letting one person know. Chapter 5 Shut your face, Jamie almost erupted. I knew there was a reason why you were a mess. I thought you were completely traumatized when you walked in here, and I think you were. I had no idea how many glasses of Thunderbird I had downed, but I knew the room was not the same as when I had walked in. However, Jamie was looking phenomenal, more elegant with each glass. You saw a dead body across the street, she repeated what I had told her. That's right, I restated. After the fourth glass of wine, I spilled every detail on what I had seen. I can't believe it, Jamie said in an almost giddy fashion. And they have no idea who it could be? I shook my head and poured another glass. Jamie took it and dumped it into her cup with the black lid. It was no surprise that telling her this story made me feel important, and the last time that I had felt important was two months ago, when Jesse told me he needed someone to drive him to the Arctic Anthropology Conference. This was a better feeling. I think I may have been supposed to call Jesse at some point in this afternoon, but I was so sloshed up on the Thunderbird wine that I wasn't sure if I could remember which speed dial he was. Probably number zero. I swear, Jamie continued, out of all the people in Queen's Rock, I can't think of a single one who could be involved with this. Queen's Rock? I repeated. That's the town a mile up the road, something finally told me where I was. These are our lovely outskirts, and they haven't seen anything interesting since, well, since grass grew outside. I don't believe this. Uh, what's going what's gonna to happen to it? Uh, what, what's his name? I stumbled on my words. The uh, motel manager guy. Little Jack, she answered. What do you mean? His life is messed up wicked good. <laughs> I laughed for some reason. I had such a bad habit of laughing at the wrong times. What do you mean? Jamie asked me. Well, he had a dead body with no head in his motel, I started. He has no idea how it got there, and all of the customers and guests had to leave now, and he might even get locked up. I finished my glass. Over half the bottle was already gone, and my brain had been borderline dead for a long time. I just wanted to tell Jamie that I wanted to make love to her. No, those were the wrong words. I wanted to dominate her and go wild, but I couldn't say that. I wasn't that far gone. It was easy to dream big when I had downed more than a bottle of wine, but Jamie had been helping. If he didn't do it, Jamie began, then he has nothing to worry about. Besides, that doesn't make sense. Why not? Little Jack owns the motel, she pointed out. At least I think he's the owner, but that's not the point. If he had killed someone in the room, he would not have left the body in there. I mean, really, what was it like walking in on that thing? The wrists were handcuffed to the bedposts, I elaborated. I only saw it for a second, but there were chains. I mean, there were handcuffs with, like, long chains. Fur-lined handcuffs? Jamie asked. I thought for a second, a total of one second. No, I denied her suggestion. They weren't. They were metal, but there was no fur. The more I said things, the more the image came back into my mind. It was scary. I felt like a little wimp for thinking that, but it scared me. I was almost shaking again. Hey, Charlie, said Jamie, noticing my reaction. Take it easy, um, you know, I think I'm cutting you off. No, I interjected. It's my wine, and I paid for it, and, and, and I gave you some. You have to let me drink it. I don't have to let you drink in here, she retorted in a nice way. This is a gas station. It's not a saloon for you, cowboy. Now put that bottle away. When Jamie was raising her voice, she was just as attractive. She knew that she was raising her voice in a way that wouldn't make me angry, and there was no way I could resist her orders when she gave them. 
I closed the bottle of Thunderbird and I slid it into the brown paper bag. My shift is over in twenty-five minutes, she announced. Yay! I exclaimed in a weird way. <laughs> right, she muttered at my drunken awkwardness. Uh, I'm sorry, I replied. I should not have said it like that. Uh, uh, what are you doing for the next evening? As the words fell out of my mouth, I realized that I had not been this drunk in years. I could handle a bottle of ordinary wine, but this Thunderbird stuff was making both my vision and the entire planet Earth spin faster, like a broken teacup ride at a second-rate amusement park. I'm walking home, Jamie informed me, and you seem a little too sloppy to get behind anything with a wheel or a large circle. Are you telling me to stay away from apple pies? I demanded. Yes, <laughs> she agreed jokingly. So, you got a car? <laughs> Somewhere, I coughed out. But I, I don't even remember where. Do you remember? Then I realized she could not possibly know. I also had no idea where my neutron star bag was. I think it was at the office of the Green Greens, but I was not going to walk all the way over there. Well, I would have walked that far if Jamie was at my side with my hand on her waist. When I was drunk, I had the weakest fantasies of any human being on the earth. Hand on her waist. I should have thought of something better than that. Well, I can't leave you here, Jamie announced to me. Get up. What are you talking about? I questioned. You and I are going to walk into town, she told me. And then she walked over to the glass doors and flipped a tiny plastic sign around from open to closed. Just like that, my bottle was in the trash can, and I was confused, beyond drunken reason, why Jamie was wasting her time with me. I also did not mind because I was so inebriated that I would have said yes to literally anything. And I mean anything. If someone had asked me to plow their fields by hand for a corn muffin and a bag of husks, I would have done it. If someone had asked me to clean up an oil spill with my tongue, I would have attempted it. If someone had asked me if Latin jazz was my favorite type of music, I might have said yes. I was that drunk. It was so fuzzy for a while, but Jamie dragged me out of the restaurant. I think she actually pulled me by the shirt because I remember being intrigued. We entered out into the sunlight, and I realized it was only about four in the afternoon. Queens Rock, Virginia. So that's where I was. Not even the state of Maryland. But Queens Rock was far more interesting than I could imagine. Well, I hadn't actually seen the town yet, but I had seen two buildings on the outskirts. One of them had a decapitated human carcass in room number one, and the other one held the most beautiful woman that I had ever seen. And I think she even touched my shirt. Jamie and I began to walk along the highway. Normally when I walk, I stick my hands into my pockets, but my fingers were flailing around easily. This is why I hated wearing denim jeans. The pockets were always too small for anything. So, Charlie, Jamie started, I need to know more about what you saw. Jamie was going on, and she was going to keep insisting about this to no end. I really did not want to get into this, but I supposed that I could tell her. After all, I had known her for nearly an hour and a half. "'Where are we going?' I asked. "'I'll show you my town,' she said. For some reason, I felt a wave of excitement, maybe because Jamie was walking in front of me, and she didn't even notice my sloppy behavior behind her. Chapter 6 The town of Queen's Rock was a pile of dust and twigs that really did not need a description, but if I had to relay my initial reaction to Queen's Rock, I would have listed all five of the buildings that were inside this unincorporated town limits. From my view, there was Angelito's Pizzeria, which was closed on this weekday afternoon, but according to the sign out front, it was going to open very shortly. Next door was a sign which read QQR Grocery. I gathered that the QR meant Queen's Rock, but I hadn't gathered what QQR meant. What's the extra Q for? I asked Jamie. It's a mystery, Charlie Brown, she replied. No one had ever called me Charlie Brown before. No one has ever called me Charlie Brown before, I pointed out, saying it out loud, but I had not indicated whether or not it was a good thing. The QQR used to be called Hank and Lorries, said Jamie, and several years back they changed it to QQR. I was left in a puzzling state, and 
Jamie also seemed a little bit confused by it. As the townscape continued before my eyes, I could see the sign which read, Dallas Warden Mechanic and Service. It did not look very inviting. Across the street there was only one other street sign in my vantage point, and then there was a building the size of a truck trailer which read, Queen's Rock Public Library. I laughed again to myself when I figured it was starting to annoy Jamie, but I wanted to laugh even more because the library just looks so dinky. Yes, dinky. That was the right word to describe it. The largest and most notable building in the town limits was none other than the salvage yard, the front office, of course, and the endless amount of junk behind it. At least that's what was tacked on to the front sign, salvage yard. I might have called it a junkyard. Mo money, salvage, and scrap. I wonder why they didn't just use the word junk. Nice, I said to Jamie, with blankness still in my voice and not providing any context. Oh, shut up, she instructed, seeing through my vocal fakeness. This is nothing and you know it, Charlie. The real town is yet to come. Glory, glory, hallelujah, I thought silently. I could not believe it. The only sources of edible food in this area were the pizza place and the tiny grocery that had an extra Q in the name, and possibly the Chevron station all outside the town limits where Jamie worked. I could have just packed a bag full of grease, sugar, and corn and saved them the trouble. We stopped walking. I know what you're thinking, Jamie informed me. What's that? I asked. You're thinking that I'm about to bore you out of your mind, she decided. It was not that far from the truth. I'm too drunk to think about the truth, I declared. Wait, wait, what? Jamie just laughed. Now it's your turn, she said. Guess what I'm thinking. I don't know, I answered before I could even ponder a guess. Oh, come on, Charlie, she urged. You have to try. I stopped for a second and I wondered what the blonde-haired girl before me was thinking about. Well, she was standing on the side of the highway with possibly the most pathetic person in plain sight, me, Charlie Roberts, so there was a chance that she was thinking about something related to me and the afternoon. Or maybe she was thinking about, why did I bring this loser along? Or maybe she was thinking, you want to show me something, I proposed out loud. I had no idea where that response came from, but it seemed to strike some sort of reaction in her eyes. Close, she consoled my failed guess. I want you to see everything. Now I didn't know where things were going. What do you mean? I asked. I have lived in this town for twelve years, she told me. Twelve years, and I have never heard anything like what you have just described. This is the most boring spot on the face of the earth, and for once there is something that makes me want to be here. I need you, Charlie. Who, what do you mean? I repeated. No one had ever needed me before. This was just weird. Don't interrupt and I'll tell you, said Jamie. Do you know how long I've worked at Chevron? Since I was fifteen years old. I've been there for four and a half years. You've seen that dump. There's nothing to do there except watch the cars come and go. I've been watching them for a long time. I could tell you. I would know if something seemed suspicious. Jamie, I tried to interject. Let me finish, she insisted. There were only four cars that stopped at the Green Greens today. Do you know what that means, Charlie? She was hard to follow. Instead of paying attention, I was thinking about chowder. There were so many types of chowder out there. There was the white New England clam chowder, then there was the red Manhattan clam chowder. Why is Manhattan clam chowder red again? I said out loud by mistake. What? She almost screamed. Well, I, I, I think it's red. I stumbled over my words. I mean, are you thinking like one of the people from... The motel, yes, yes, yes. One of the people from the motel had something to do with the body? Thankfully, I could piece together some parts of her plan, and I had redirected from that deviation related to soup. Obviously, Jamie chattered with lots of glee. See, it has to be someone in one of the four cars, or someone from here in Queen's Rock. And trust me, I know everyone here in Queen's Rock. Whoa, whoa, I tried to halt the conversation. What are you getting yourself into? I'm gonna figure this out, 
she stated with passion, and I need your help. I need you to just remember. Remember the sight. Remember the smells. Any detail at all. When you saw the body. Even the memory of it was making me feel shaky inside. It's like the inside of me was freezing any time I thought about it. I have to drive to Wisconsin tomorrow. I reminded her I have an Arctic Anthropology Conference to attend. Well, then we have today, Jamie reminded me right back. And just like that, we were walking again. I was not sure where we were going, but Jamie seemed to know. Then she turned and paused. Her eyes went across the road, and we were peering into the window at Angelito's Pizzeria. There he is, she pointed out. What? I inquired. Little Jack. When he gets upset, he buries himself inside Angelito's. Sometimes he doesn't come out until they drag his sleeping carcass out and toss him on the grass. You might think that's a joke, but it's not. I was surprised because the sign said that the place wasn't going to be open for another fifteen minutes. The sign says that it's not going to be open for another fifteen minutes, I said out loud. Well, little Jack knows the owners. I know the owners. Everybody here knows everyone. They let him in early. It's not that complicated, Charlie. What can little Jack tell us? I asked. He will tell us every detail of those four cars, she mentioned. By the way, why didn't you drive up to the motel? I laughed once more. I didn't feel like it, I replied. Jamie gave me another dumbfounded facial expression. But wait, I indicated for her to stop. Will he really talk to us? Of course, Jamie predicted with certainty. Uh, right, well, I'm sure he'd talk to you, I continued. But why would he talk to me? Jamie just smiled. Because you left your suitcase in his motel, she thankfully reminded me. Oh, yeah, I said. Stupid neutron star bag. However, Jamie was keen to notice that I hadn't showed up at the Chevron station with any luggage, so that meant that I didn't have it with me, and it could have either have been in the car or the motel, but the last place that I had told her about was the motel. Therefore, Jamie had put two and two together. She was smart. She was smart indeed. Angelito's smelled great. It was the pure scent of baking. Both the booths and the tables had cracked red plastic as a surface, and I was surprised that people could sit in the booth seats without making additional cracks in them. Little Jack was seated at the table, and there were people in the back cooking. Sit down, Charlie, Jamie requested to me. I'm afraid of falling on the tiles, I told her, without context once again. What are you doing here? Little Jack asked me in his thick Bengali accent. Before I responded, I noticed that Jamie had not been joking about Little Jack drowning his stress in pizza. The man had a full 18-inch pizza in front of him that was overflowing with layers of extra cheese. There might have been toppings, but I could not see them under the ocean of toasted mozzarella. For some reason, I was incredibly hungry, and it did not help that he had six untouched hot wings at my side, coated in that orange buffalo sauce. My mouth was beginning to fill with saliva just thinking about those wonderful wings. That was one of the few things that I missed about Mississippi Valley State University. We would order hot wings, cover them with red pepper flakes and more Tabasco. Then we could race to see who could eat 24 the fastest. The only person that could beat me was Jesse. Please have a seat if you must, Little Jack requested of me. I overcame my fear of falling on the tiles for some reason, and I sat down next to Jamie. At that moment, I was incredibly impressed with Little Jack. He had finished half of the 18-inch pizza, and it didn't look like he was slowing down for a man his size. So, what do you want? I already gave you a refund, Little Jack pointed out to me, and I did not respond. He's not really being himself, Jamie mentioned. I understand, Little Jack nodded along. My bag is still in your office, I managed to say. Right, right, Little Jack acknowledged. I'm a little busy right now, though. He took another giant bite of the cheese pizza. Mm. I began humming out loud. Is he always this weird? Little Jack asked Jamie. 
I think you've known him longer than I have, she said. So, what are you doing here, Jamie? Little Jack wondered. And did you get him drunk or something? No, I defended myself rather loudly. Next, I felt Jamie grab my wrist and squeeze hard. Ouch, I whelped. Stop making a scene. They did this to m for me as a courtesy, letting me in here. Why don't you get him something to eat, Jamie? If you put food into his mouth, it will keep him from shouting things. Smart individual, I complimented him. Little Jack was not impressed. I don't have any money on me, Jamie revealed. You know that, Jack. Fine, Jack snarled. Here, whatever your name is. Little Jack broke off a slice of the pizza and tossed it right on the table landing right on the red plastic surface. Aside from finding a mutilated corpse in my room this afternoon, this was the best day of my life. That cheese was so warm, and there was so much of it. I don't think I had ever eaten a better piece of cheese, sauce, and bread in my life. Also, Jamie began to develop her interrogation skills. Wait, little Jack cut her off. I am short of this guy. What's his name? Charlie, said Jamie. This Charlie, he continued, has told you about everything, everything that has happened. Before you get into my business, I will let you know that this is out of line. I'm going to lose business for one week because of this. They are not going to let me keep any of the units open. Not one. So what do you want to know about the incident that is going to shut me down and ruin my life? I am all ears for you, Jamie Laurent. <laughs> Your name sounds French. I laughed again as I took another bite of the pizza. He had pronounced it like Laurent. It sounded almost like low rent. They both turned to me and ignored my ignorant comment. I'm going to tell you something, Jamie grinned. Somebody left a person, a human being, dead inside your motel. Somebody is responsible, and if you find out who that person is, they will go to jail. But there's more to it than that. If someone caused you to lose business, you can find a way to use this to your advantage. If the police weren't doing their jobs, you could sue them. If someone allowed a maniac to enter your motel, you could sue them too. But first, you have to find out who did this. That is the only way you can stay in the game. Do you get what I'm saying? Little Jack swallowed a large piece of pizza and nodded. Now, Jamie went on, tell me about the four cars that were parked at your motel. Tell me about all of them. Chapter 7 I did not make a noise as I sat back and watched Jamie unfold these ideas to Little Jack. From my point of view, this would have been hilarious. I would have been laughing on the inside if Jamie hadn't been doing the same thing to me the whole time. She was a manipulator. She told stories and lies to get what she wanted. Was there a chance that Little Jack could sue someone for leaving a body in his motel? I had no idea, let alone could he sue the police for not doing their jobs. From where I was sitting, I could hear nothing in her voice but fabrication. I've got a few things to take care of, Little Jack announced. I'm leaving here in a while, but then I will be back at six o'clock. Meet me here, and I will take you there. I'll take you to the motel. And you, Charlie, sir, why are you staring at my hot wings? I already gave you a slice of pizza. They just don't look... Very hot, I mumbled. Well, you'll have to buy your own. And Jamie, maybe you should get him some water. Okay then, Jamie said, as she interrupted my view of the six hot wings and their lovely red, white, and orange cardboard dish. Let's get going, Charlie. We'll be back here at six, Jack. And Charlie, I'm going to get you a bottle of water on the way out. And just like that, Jamie was dragging me out of the store, and she walked back in to get the bottle of water. I really did not mind that much, as I think she was smiling a little bit too wide. It was kind of nice, but then I started smiling too wide as well, and that was horrible. I was not hiding my admiration for her. It's just after four, said Jamie as she emerged. We'll have about an hour and forty-five minutes before we need to get back here. Oh my god, I don't know if I can wait that long. I mean, I also... I don't know why you're not more excited, Charlie. Then my intoxication and my long smile faded. You didn't see the body, I said to Jamie in a straight voice. She turned to me and realized that for the first time in an hour, I had said something that had real meaning and wasn't just drunken, sloshed-up behavior. 
I guess that makes it different, she agreed. Hey, come on, Charlie. I think I know a way for you to sober up. Can I just sleep out here on the grass? I coughed out in my exhausted voice. Y you said they, they did that to little Jack. Sometimes, like, they put a... Keep moving, Charlie, she called to me as I tried to sit down. I was starting to feel unusually tired, and I wanted nothing more than to sit on the grass. No, I wanted to lie down on the grass and just fall asleep so fast. That would have made everything better. I felt my body falling toward the soft grass. Whoa, wait a second, Jamie gasped as she tried to pull me back. Yeah, you need to sober up. Here, drink the water. Drink as much as you can. Drinking was fun and all, but you and I have found something more exciting than a bottle of Thunderbird. It was a bottle and a half, I corrected her. Even though Jamie had been helping me drink, yet she didn't show the smallest sign of intoxication. Now I was aware that I was flailing around like a sloppy mess, and I needed to regain my composure. After all, I didn't want to humiliate Jamie in front of her people. I'm good, I lied. Okay, Jamie knew I was lying. So, where are we going, I asked as Jamie began to walk. You'll see, she told me. No, no, you, you, you have to tell me where we're going, I demanded. I said, you'll see, she repeated. And just like that, I was silent. Jamie was good at making people do what she wanted, or think how she wanted. We kept walking onward, and I was a foot behind her. Periodically, she would look back to check on me, to make sure I was still there, and to make sure that I was not about to throw up on her back. As much as I had loved Queen's Rock's commercial district, the residential atmosphere was slightly more charming. I was walking down the street, and I didn't know the name of it, but I could see the setting sun, and this place was extremely comfortable. I could see a, two well-built homes, and the rest were double-wides and trailers that had tacky front porches, but I was no architect, so I had no room to comment or complain. I was so tired. All I wanted to do was fall asleep, but I was slowly regaining full awareness and composure uh, and being able to see clearly. That was the point of this trip, I suppose. Jamie wanted me to relax, but now I found myself in a drunken, stumbling walking mess, but I was slipping out of it, and I was just trying to appreciate the tiny town somewhere in Virginia. The wind was starting to blow, and it started to feel cold. It was extremely cold, actually, and even in my drunken stupor, I did not feel good at all for some reason. Then Jamie stopped. Ooh, what is it? I asked. Want to come inside? She asked right back, and motioned toward a trailer with light blue aluminum siding. The porch had a green plastic flooring, and there were two chairs with a blue and white checkered pattern on them. Is this, uh, your place? I wondered out loud. Nope, she smiled casually, and then led me inside without knocking. I had no choice but to follow. Actually, I wanted to follow. Saying no would have been a lot less interesting.